of artillery fire. Still evidence of climate change. Drone warfare as Russia. Tornadoes whipping across the Midwest. As people rush to stock up on supplies during this border crisis. Massive forest fires in the Siberian Arctic this year. Tonight, Dozens of the migrants Federal Reserve this announcing rare emergency action. Calm financial fears. Pandemic, hospitalizations and hospitalizations rare emergency action. Tonight, the whole Russian recession fire alarm sounding. 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 Tonight, the whole Russian recession when danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. He ducked and cover, ducked and cover. He did what we all must learn to do. Man, good morning, Calvary Wallace. I want you guys to stand to your feet, put your hands together, and give God the biggest praise that you've given him all week. Amen. And while you're still standing, I want you to look at a man in your vicinity, whether they're a father or not, and just smile at him, wave at him, and let him know how thankful you are. Man, I am thankful for the men in this house who refuse to just sit in the back and do nothing. They lead from the front. It's an absolute big deal and before we get started i don't know if they're watching or not but they may see it somewhere down the line i want to honor pastors brad and pastor kayla they're we're in week three of our of our new series but they're in week three of a sabbatical and, and i'm going to tell you i know it's been refreshing and rejuvenating for them but it's also been refreshing for me to be able to to see them relax it's a big deal so we honor you guys. We're thankful that you guys get this time off, and I'm waiting for you to come back because I know there are going to be fireworks in July. But go ahead and sit down. Let's go ahead and dive head first into this week's message. Again, we are in week three of winning the war for our minds, and today we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm joined by three very good friends, um, some I've lived with, some I've laughed with, and some I've cried with, but they are amazing Fathers, they're amazing individuals, and I'm going to introduce them to you today. On my right, I have Tylen Kelly, who is our Connections Lead. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you, Uncle Jamel. <laughs> <laughs> I got Pastor Giovanni Sauceda, who is from Calvary Wallace Latino. Yeah. <laughs> and then I got Wally Bachelor, who is our Discipleship Director. Yeah. Good morning. Now, in this series, we've been looking at how to win the war in our mind. Now, mind wars are those negative thoughts that we all battle that feed our insecurities, they feed our worries, and they feed our fears. It's the thoughts that lead us into irrational anger and undefined depression. But we have good news for you. All of us have good news for you, church. With Jesus' help, the wars in our mind can be won. And it's not just up to you or me on our own to win those wars. No. Jesus wants to partner with us to help overcome all of those negative mind intruders. That, mean he's a, that means he's asking us to take an active role in recognizing, rejecting, and replacing negative thoughts. And then we get to retrain our minds to keep those thoughts from returning. Now, Tom, you can help me remember this. About five or six years ago, I took the dumbest trip I've ever taken in my entire life. It was so hot. So hot. It was like 117 degrees on the National Mall. And me and Tylen and probably five or six other friends had this bright idea to go to a Christian concert in Washington, D.C. They were having it on the National Mall, not realizing it was going to be so hot that we weren't going to be able to see straight and not be able to find water. Was, literally, we were in the desert in the middle of Washington, D.C. So before the trip, you know, we started planning this thing. And I had been to Washington, D.C. once before. And I don't think anybody else had been, but... I became the de facto leader as it happens. So, Jamel, you can figure this thing out. I was, all right, cool. I'll, I'll plan the transportation. You need to order. This is where we're staying at. You need this metro pass for the day. Like, I got it figured out. So, we get to Washington, D.C. We get to the metro, which is a subway system. Subways and buses. All right, cool. I got the travel figured out already. When we get to the, the train station, we're going to take the yellow train, three stops, get off, get on the blue train, go two stops, and we'll be three blocks from the National Mall. So it's like, all right, cool, let's go. So we get to the subway, and I realized instantly that I had it wrong. We should have took the blue train three stops and the yellow train two. But anyway, we ended up getting to the National Mall, but I think it's funny because 
as we were preparing for this series or preparing for this message, I had this thought that I'm going to ask you guys. Have you ever taken a train before? If so, you know how important it is that you get on the right train and know where that train is going. After all, that's the whole point of taking a train anyway. Like, it's to get us somewhere. And our thoughts are a lot like trains. Our thoughts direct our lives. But so often we jump on these random trains of thought without knowing the real destination that they're leading us to. Many people end up in places that they don't want to be, and then they start to wonder why or how they got there. But it only makes sense that oftentimes we find ourselves boarding trains of thought to self-pity city or anger town or even depressionville without even realizing it. As a pastor, I talk to people all the time, and many times people ask me this question, like, man, I can't believe God put me in this. And sometimes I sit and I think like, well, I don't think God put you in that. And then I would imagine that God sitting in heaven is like, what are you talking about? I didn't put you in that. Like, I didn't send you here. You boarded the wrong train of thought. The wrong train carries thoughts of worry. It carries thoughts of guilt and condemnation. They carry thoughts that cause you to feel insecure and question yourself. Thoughts that bring sadness. This is one that hits a lot of us. Thoughts that cause suspicion of others' motives. Thoughts that bring doubt and then thoughts that bring inaccurate assumptions. Every day we're going to be bombarded with mind wars trying to steal our joy, trying to steal our peace, trying to take away our confidence, trying to mess up our relationships, and trying to tempt us to doubt God's word. But we have to keep focus on what he says about us and not the things that are happening around us. Mind wars seek to create chaos and havoc, but Jesus is all about calm and peace. There is no condemnation in the fact that mind wars are raging in your mind right now. Every single one of us deal with them. You do, I do, he do, she do, they do, we all do. But we all have a choice. Will we allow them to defeat us? We will allow them to affect who we are or God's plans for our life? Or will we conquer them? My question is, how do you conquer them? How do you win the war in your mind. Wally. Man, it's, it's good. Well, I want to start this morning talking about faith because faith is what conquers. Right, right. That's good. And it only conquers if we understand what faith is because there are tons and tons of misconceptions in our culture today about what faith is. You know, and if you, if you say that you've got faith uh, in, in God, or you, you've got a faith that allows you to move through things, you'll hear misconceptions and people will say, oh, you're, uh, you're un, uneducated or you're naive or you just think things are going to work out well um, because you say that you've got faith. Um, other people would even say that, that faith is just a type of, of a religion yeah. in and of itself. Right. And so we just, we hear these things over and over and then we hear it used incorrectly. So not just necessarily negatively aimed at us, but then we hear it used incorrectly uh, in the culture around us. So people will say, um, you know, Pastor Chad, you got this going on. Man, you just got to have faith. In what? In what? In, his, in the pizza he had for lunch? In the coffee? Okay, I have faith in coffee occasionally. Um, they're like, that's a legit thing. But in faith in what? Okay. So faith in coffee is not going to help me conquer my mind wars. It may help me conquer my, you know, to-do list for today, but it's not going to help me conquer my mind wars. So when we, when we hear it all day long from everybody around us and sometimes even from ourselves, because we get it wrong occasionally, we get, we get our, the, the mindset messed up, and then we don't know how to conquer those mind wars. And so all these things that we're talking about, these are all complete misconceptions, None of them are correct from a biblical perspective. So if we want a biblical perspective of what faith is, probably where should we go? That'd be a great start, guys. Let's, let's start there. So a very simple definition of faith this morning. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. I'm going to read it a little slow because it's a lot of words here. And I want you to grasp it so that we can have a great foundation uh, for where we're headed this morning. So the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith. So what is faith? 
Trust in God. Trust in God. So this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. What a deep verse of scripture here that we've probably blown right past many times in our reading. So this faith, which is trust in God, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. So faith is trust in God. How do we conquer mind wars? How do we conquer all the things that go on in our head that tell us all the negative things about us, about our situation, about others? Faith is our trust in God. So a belief, a, a faith is a trust in God, a belief that he knows what he's doing regardless of the external circumstances. People who possess a strong presence of faith automatically have fewer challenges with mind wars than those who don't. Why? Because your immediate response in life is to go to the faith aspect. Now that's not always, e- it sounds simple, but that's not always easy. But when you have a natural disposition to immediately go to the faith side, and we're gonna talk about what that means over the next few minutes, you're more likely to succeed in life because you have less interference from the negative side. So when you're constantly looking into the faith aspect, the negative can't get in as easily. So again, let's jump back into some biblical references here. So the Bible is packed with people who relied on their faith in God. But let's look at one example in the New Testament. We're gonna talk about Saul. So Saul was what we would consider a hardline Jew. And what that meant was any specific thing in their theology, philosophy, day-to-day, normal routines, just kind of the cultural understood perspective, a hardline Jew would take that to the extreme. So Saul was that guy. And so what he did is he made it his life mission to persecute and kill as many Christians as he possibly could. It was his life goal to annihilate every Christian that he came in contact with, all right? We'd probably not call him a nice guy, all right? (laughs) So that was Saul. So one day, as Saul is on the road to Damascus, he has an experience with Jesus, and it's a literal, like a blinding light that just hits him right in the middle of the road, much like the sun shining and reflecting against my skin. So this light blinds Saul as he's walking, and he hears this voice that comes out and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul has no clue who this is. Saul has no idea. However, because of the way that it is spoken, he understands that the voice is holy in nature. And so his response is, and we preach all day long on that, his response is, Who are you, Lord? Not call him Lord as I know you, Jesus, Lord. I understand this is a holy in nature conversation, so let me respond properly. And so he responds. He says, who are you, Lord? And so everything that Saul knew about faith in that moment began to just be completely flipped upside down. And so now Saul, who was on a mission, who thought he knew his reason for living and what he was going to do with his entire life, now Saul has to begin to question a few things. So what what have we been calling that? Mind wars. So now Saul's dealing with that. So the voice replied, it says, I am Jesus, the one whom you're persecuting. And so put yourself in Saul's shoes for just a minute. Everything you've known is just being completely flipped upside down. And so now Saul's dealing with uh, unbelief you know, pride challenges because, hey, I thought I was doing the right thing, but now I realize I'm not. And so he's got all these wars going on in his life. And so you think in, in his shoes, not only does he just now find out that he's been doing the wrong thing all along, but he's been actively working against the right thing. And so again, we, we have a tendency to skip over some of this stuff when we're reading and when we're thinking about even our own lives, because one, one of the challenges when, when Jess and I got married, because I, I remember this so vividly, we struggled with communication when we first got married. 
almost 15 years ago. She came from a very different background than I did. I don't know if you've met the two of us, but we're very different personalities. Um, She's more extroverted now than she's ever been. But when I met her, you, you couldn't get her to say anything until she warmed up to you. I know that's hard to believe sometimes now because now she's more extroverted. But that made it very challenging for us to communicate because, you know, if, if I have a challenge with Fuzzy, I want Fuzzy to talk back. Like, let's work through this. That's my personality. Jess was, if you have a problem with me, I'm going to shut down and walk out. I'm like, hold up. <laughs> no, no, we got to work through this. And she's like, don't touch me. Don't talk to me. Don't look at me. Walk away. And I'm like, this, this isn't going to work. And so thankfully, my wife is a very understanding woman and is also very intelligent. And as we began to talk through things, and this took a lot of time, but as she began to explain to me things, I realized that not only was I approaching it incorrectly the way I was doing it, because I thought everybody was like me, I know that's hard to believe, uh, but I thought everybody was like me. So not only was I approaching it incorrectly, but I was actively working against her way of responding. And so that hurt, that hurt deep. And so I dealt with mind wars during that time that, um, that I had no idea what I was doing. I wasn't cut out for this married life thing. I was doing pretty good as a bachelor and now I got into this marriage thing and it's not going good. Like, I messed it up. And so I dealt with mind words. So think about that just on a communication standpoint. And now we look at Saul, and Saul wasn't communication. Saul was killing people. Yeah. Yeah. And so I could go back and fix some of my mistakes with communication. <laughs> Saul couldn't go back and fix that. Yeah. Right. Not to make light of the situation, but you can't go back and fix that. Right. And so imagine what Saul was dealing with. And then to top it all off at the end of this somewhat of a conversation that that Jesus has with him, Um, Saul is now blind. And so now Saul has to be led into the city by hand because he's completely blind where he's told to wait for the next word. And so the three days later, if you guys remember the story, Ananias comes uh, at, at the will of Jesus and speaks to him and gives him a word and God immediately restores his sight. And then from that single moment forward, Saul became a dynamic evangelist for the gospel and for the kingdom and ended up changing his name and then writing almost two-thirds of the New Testament. So if God can take Saul, completely change his life, and then have him write two-thirds of the New Testament, what can God do where I messed up with communication? Does that make sense? So we've got to have faith. Faith in what? Faith in God. Our trust in God. So remember this truth as we go through this morning. We're going to talk about a lot of things, but remember this truth. When your faith becomes big, mind wars become small. It doesn't mean that they don't exist because we're human. Life is challenging sometimes. But when your faith is bigger, mind wars are smaller. And so if your scale is off balance and mind wars are too big, what should you do to the other side of the equation? Make it bigger. Build, build the faith there. And we're gonna talk about how to do that this morning. But it is impossible to continue to be controlled by negativity when you have an ongoing awareness of the faith of God in your life or what God believes true about you in Christ Jesus. Man, that's good, Wally. When your faith becomes big, mind wars become small. Is that realization that anchors us in the understanding of something very, very, very powerful. Faith defeats mind wars. Today, we're going going to kick it old school. Today. We used to do a lot of acronyms like the first five or six years I came to to Calvary. Acronyms like every other week. It was great. That's how I communicate with people in a lot of ways. So we're going to kick it old school today. And we're going to consider an acronym for faith. F A I. T-H, that will help us become more and more aware of God's presence and power in our lives. So let's take a look at each of these phrases that make up the acronym. And we'll get started with, Tyler, why don't you kick us off? Tell us about letter F. I would be glad to. So F is the first letter in faith. And F for us today stands for focus on the positive. So as a young baseball player growing up, I was really wanting to play baseball at the college level. And in high school, I was training to be a a better hitter. I was training as a hitter, and 
as I would train day after day uh, with my coaches, they would point things out to me that I was doing wrong. And throughout all of that, I would begin to focus on what I kept hearing. Everything, like you're, you're not getting your foot down in time. You, you're, you're, your swing is, is too much of an uppercut. Whatever it may be, and I just kept hearing these, these things that I was doing wrong. And so I put my focus on correcting myself But the more I focused on correcting myself, the worse my performance became. Then one day, one of my coaches gave me a video of a a professional baseball player who is named Miguel Cabrera. And if you don't know who Miguel Cabrera is, he's one of the greatest hitters of all time. Let me read some stats to you about Miguel Cabrera's career. So he is currently, he is still playing and is currently hitting for his career 310. Um, with almost 10,000 at-bats, and he has over 3,000 hits, over 500 home runs, and over 1,800 runs batted in. If you are unaware of what those stats mean, that is very good. (laughs) Hall of Famer status, okay? Like, not even a question of whether he's going to make it in the Hall of Fame or whatever. And these stats have led him to actually winning what is, uh, he's won four American League batting titles. And what that means is he had the highest batting average out of anybody in his league. And so for me as a hitter, this is somebody I wanted to pay close attention to. So I began to watch this video and other videos of Miguel Cabrera. And I wanted to, uh, to focus on, on what he was doing. So instead of focusing on my own shortcomings or flaws as the young college baseball hopeful, I started to pay attention to what Cabrera did. I studied his form and I focused on the things that he did. And so I began to implement the things that he did into my own style of hitting. So instead of focusing on the negative things, creating a don't do this mindset, okay, That should sound familiar. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't go there. Don't talk to those people. So instead of focusing on the negative, the things that I was doing wrong, I switched my mindset. And when I switched it up to a do it like this mindset, go there and do this and go and do that. Unsurprisingly, my hitting began to change drastically. I hit better than I ever had before in my entire life. And I did end up making it and playing baseball at the college level because I changed my mindset. I focused on the positive things that I could implement that worked instead of all the negative things that I was doing wrong. And if you know anything about baseball, it's a failure-based sport. So even Miguel Cabrera, whose stats I just read out to you, he's had 10,000 at-bats and only gotten 3,000 hits, which is an absurd amount. But he still failed almost 70% of the time that he hit. So instead of focusing on the 70% of his negatives, he's focused on his 30% of the positives when he's been successful. So now let's look at it biblically. So as New Covenant believers, we've been encouraged to set our focus on Jesus, the true champion. We no longer look at our performance, but we focus on the perfect performance of Jesus, not us, of Jesus. So just like me as the young college baseball hopeful, any given day, we all possess bad situations in our lives and good situations. So as you face the second half of 2022, understand you are going to deal with your share of troubles. But let me tell you this, believer, you're also going to enjoy your share of blessings. Your faith will grow when you focus on those positives. Focus on the blessings that God has given you, not the negative things that has happened to you. Your focus must be on the champion in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We've heard that so many times. So every day you must decide what you're going to focus on. God won't decide that for you. You have to decide what to focus on. So ask ask yourself this question. And I want you to really ask yourself this question and really think about it. 
Ask yourself this, has my life improved when I have focused on all of the negative things around me? Let that marinate for a second. Yeah, yeah. It's tough. Literally, like really reflect on that. That's one reason why we talk about negative mindsets with social media and how that can cause negative thoughts because of all of the bad news that is shared on there. Yeah. Let me say this for you. Positive minds produce positive lives. And negative minds produce negative lives. Say it again. Say it again. Positive minds produce positive lives. And negative minds produce negative lives. Positive minds are always full of faith. And negative minds are always full of mind wars. Man, that's good. Put your hands together for Tyler. My goodness. (laughs) Pastor Gio, let's keep it rolling. Won't you... Take the A in, in faith. Yes, sir. The second letter is A, affirm yourself. I'm going to start with a question. What do you say to yourself all day? Don't underestimate the effect of your internal dialogue is on your faith. Internal dialogue is what you say to yourself. Are you, are you allowing the negative thoughts coming to your head, to insecurity, to low self war? Your biggest bully, your biggest bully is, is not in work. It's not the classroom. It's not the place where you go. It's on yourself. It's in your mind. Yeah. Right. Your biggest bull is the boy is the inside of you and your head. You are the own biggest bullet. So when you go a place, you most of the time you're always thinking, I'm being bull- bullied in here and there where you go, but really it's not. It's in your inside of you. Yeah, that's right. Instead, why, why not to identify with the, with the you the who is the me, the, and the metamorphosis of God's plan? Why not to identify with the new you in Christ Jesus? Right. The new God has a creating, writing the you, the old past, and Adam. Because most of the time, that's what we do. We always, we always come, we know when we come to Christ, we come to be a new creation. Do you agree with me? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. But we always think about the old person. Yeah. Well, we should be focused on the new creation that God's already yeah. done for us. Right now, and your mind might be a caterpillar, but thank God that you are on your way to becoming a oh, butterfly. Wow. That's yeah. good. So you know what's the process. When you see a, a, a caterpillar, you know it's not going to stay there. Right, you right. know it's going to come to be a butterfly. Yeah, that's right. So thank you for a second. You being the caterpillar in this moment, but we will be a butterfly. Yeah, that's good. You can either think of you who's a struggling breakout, the weak, the little, the weakless caterpillars. Or you can be focused on you. Listen, you. Say me. me. The who's free with the wings are strong enough to, for you to fly around the function that God created you to. Fly over the chain. Condemnation in all mindsets. So I got experience to build uh, a great pastor, uh, Pastor Brent, Pastor Kayla's house. It was an honor. It was a pleasure. And I know it was so much joy for them because it was a house they was dreaming. So we had to go through the process. And the process is not easy. Wally and family, you guys be ready. So <laughs> Pastor Brad, he was calling all the friends, you know, say, hey, come on, let's go to the land. Let's go to, go to the property. So they start bringing dirt, they start bringing wood, and that's, they start seeing everything. Yeah. For their friend, it was not a really nice-looking place. But Pastor Brandon Blueprint hey, is like, hey, guess what? Wally, this is where it's going to be the bedroom, the master bedroom. He started pointing every place in that property where it's going to be the house. Yeah, right. Hey, I'm going to head a garage with two cars where I can fit. So guess what? It was a moment where the friends, like, they, they come and be like, okay, it's good. Let's go to get something to eat. They was ready. <laughs> Listen, because they, was, they don't see what Pastor Brad and Pastor Kelly and the rest of the, the family was seeing. So, just remember, a caterpillar is coming to be a butterfly in one moment. Yeah. So, that's beautiful when we go to weekend now, the friends say, nah, that's beautiful. Can we go get something to eat? But it doesn't face that your friends are not happy what they see because, they, well, the house is under construction. You're exciting about what is not what is. Listen, they was exciting but they were, the friends, I'm not saying they was not exciting, but they don't see it done. Right. All right. All right. So, see minds work out you to focus on what you see in your life right now. All your failures, all your shortcomings, and the you doesn't measure, measure up. Minds work want you to focus on the door and the ugly concrete foundation. This is what they want you to think is you. But God is saying, no, there's a champion inside of you. Right, I want you right. to put your hand right now and just share it and say, I'm, it's a champion inside of me. Inside of me. Amen. That's so good. You might not be feel like it. Listen, you might not feel like it. Yeah. You might not believe it or you might not see it, but you are in your way to be exactly where God wants you 
to be. Yeah. Mm. Paul saying Philipp, Philippians chapter 1, first verse 4 and 6. I always pray with joy because of your partnership and the gospel from the first day. Listen, from the first day until now being confident of this, of, of this was he who has begun a good work and we will carry you on to completion unto the days of Christ Jesus. Don't get caught on, on just what exists today. Speak positive, positive things to yourself. Speak life into your future. Your mind is a work in process, and God is not finished yet. That is so good. So one of the things that I feel like can be a challenge sometimes is a lot like what Pastor Gio was talking about. Some people are wired to be able to visualize something immediately, right. and some people aren't. Okay, um, it's not inherently bad or good either way. It's just how we're wired. And so I grew up in the construction industry um, most of my life until I moved to North Carolina. So when I walk into an empty shell, so if this room had absolutely nothing in it, if I walked in here and, um, you know, Pastor Brad comes in and says, hey, we're going to do a platform here, a tech booth there. We're going to have lights here. Um, you know, bathrooms will be out there. None of these walls exist. I immediately can picture... 99% of that, because I grew up in that. That's how, that's how my brain is wired. My wife, on the other hand, she's like, if you don't get out some markers and rulers and stencils and draw me a picture, I got nothing. And I will be excited for you, but I can't be excited myself because I can't see it. But that's how she's wired. And so that can be a challenge. But what I wanna talk about next for the I in faith so I would be, imagine, imagine God doing something good in your situation. So it doesn't matter how you're wired, and it does, it, you being able to imagine something does not require you to be wired a certain way. Why? Because think about when you were three, how many imaginary friends did you have? Two. Um, too many? Is that what you said? <laughs> two. Oh, two. <laughs> like, who told you it was too many, Pastor Jamal? <laughs> so my three-year-old... Who's, who just turned four, not that long ago, but she will tell me and talk to me for hours about all of her imaginary friends and all the things that she's doing. And she even dreams about these. She was up seven times last night and wow. never was fully awake, but had to tell me every time I went into her room about how she was trying to write something. I have no idea what she was talking about. I couldn't follow it, but she was imagining. And too often we we relegate imagination to our younger selves or to a younger generation or to, I'm too old to spend my time dreaming dreams about things that are never gonna come to pass. How many times do we say that? But when we're looking at the word faith and the understanding of faith is how it opposes mind wars, we have to be able to imagine things. We have to be able to imagine God doing something incredible in our lives and using it for the positive. Yeah, yeah. So ultimately, what you imagine determines what you believe. Right. And how you believe determines how you receive. Yeah, right. Did you get that? So what you imagine determines what you believe, where your brain starts. And then how you believe determines how you receive. Imagination can be used positively and negatively. So if I believe, if a doctor calls me and says, hey, we ran your blood work, we need to talk. Uh -oh. All right, like, can you give me a little bit more? No, we'll see you in two months. I'll tell you then. What am I gonna do for two months? Yeah. Freak out. Yeah. Because while I only go to the doctor like once every 15 years. <laughs> so there's a plethora of things that could be challenging in that blood work. I've gotten older, I've gained weight. I don't eat healthy. I don't know if y'all have been to lunch with me, but we eat whatever's on the table. I'll eat mine, I'll eat yours, I'll eat his, whatever it happens to be. But what is my imagination going to do? And see, we relegate positive imagination to a younger generation, but the negative imagination will grab in a heartbeat. So we'll just process these things. And we'll just, we'll just start running scenarios in our head and be like, oh, it could be this, it could be that, it could be this, it could be that. Um, you know, or anything could go wrong in our life. You know, or if, if the money's not there, or if the situation doesn't line up the way that we think that it should, 
we begin to run those scenarios. And that's something that I've been challenged with most of my life because I, I unfortunately deal with some pretty extreme anxiety at times. And anxiety produces your brain to run in a negative imagination constantly. Um, so I don't know if you guys struggle with that in any area of your life, but when you have anxiety, you just begin to dwell on the negative over and over and over and over and over until you're sick to your stomach. You can't sleep right, you can't eat right, and it just all continues to go downhill from there. So one of the things that God has had to help me with over the course of my life, and thankfully sent me an incredibly intelligent wife, who we spent a whole lot of money sending to school to be able to help me, and others, um, they, God and, and Jess helped me refocus that brain power. So I'm already spending the brain power anyway, right? I'm just putting it towards the negative. So what they help me do when I'm really struggling is to shift it on its head and put it towards the positive. So now when both of our businesses go into a three to four week recession out of nowhere and there's no money anywhere, because there's no regular J-O-B. It's all small business income. My brain could immediately go to all the bills I can't pay. Or my brain could go to all the sales that God could bring in while I'm sleeping. Because ultimately, God is the giver of all good things. And so God brings everything to our life that we need. And so why, why spend my time laying in bed tonight thinking about everything that's gonna go wrong tomorrow because I have no money, when I could say, hey, we have two businesses that are online. Hey, there are like, I don't wanna get this wrong, it sounds stupid. There are like seven billion people on the planet that all have access primarily to the World Wide Web. Why can't they all shop Remedy by Jess tonight? They could. Glory. Glory. All of them. I'm gonna run out of soap. I can make more, but I'm gonna run out tonight. But why not? And that's what I want you to understand and grasp. Why not? So, well, why am I going to run out of money? Why not, why not God bring you in $6,000 in sales tonight? Why not God repair that relationship that you've been trying to repair on your own for 20 years and you can't talk to each other in the same room because there's too much animosity? What if you both wake up tomorrow and God has worked on both your hearts and you become best friends in 24 hours? Why not? Is God the creator of everything? Is God the comforter? Is what we sang this morning, what, Jaira? Yeah. What are we singing that song? He's more than enough. More than enough of what? Everything. Yeah. So why not? And that's my question this morning. Why not? Why, can God, why can't God do that in your life? So imagine, imagination. Imagine that, that son, that daughter, that mother, that father, uh, that friend, that family member who has not come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ yet that you've been praying for, imagine them coming to Christ. Imagine them feeling that love and making a lifestyle change uh, to where they, they understand who their savior is. Imagine yourself sitting at the desk of that new job you've been praying for. Why not? Because the alternative is to imagine yourself not there yet. And what good is that gonna do? Like, how is that gonna help you get through your day imagining all the things you don't have? Right. Imagine yourself in that position. Imagine yourself being open to doing anything for him, whatever he puts in your heart and in your hands. Why can we imagine this? Like, what, what gives us the right? Because I'm a very practical person too. You know, think, I'm operating the prophetic, so everything is black or white. There's, there's not a lot of gray area in my life. It is or it isn't. So my immediate question on everything is why? Why? What, what gives me the right, Pastor Gio, to just always focus on the positive? Well, I'm glad you asked, Pastor Gio. Because <laughs> in James chapter 1, verse 7, it says that every good and perfect gift is from where? Above. It's not from Pastor Gio. Although he gives very good and perfect gifts, Every good and perfect gift does not come from Pastor Geo. It comes from above. Yeah. Right. And so if we, if we believe that our heavenly father loves us and we believe that all scripture is true, then we can also believe because A plus B equals C, again, we gotta get literal here, <laughs> that every good and perfect gift comes from him. So why not? Why not spend your, ima your imaginational, is that a word? Yeah. Imaginational brain power on the positive. 
So much like, much like a father to his kids, you know, it's Father's Day. I've got to bring in the fathers for a minute. Do I want what's best for my kids? You better believe I do. They got to take care of me when I get old. They got to get all the good now. So I'm set up for life. I want every good and perfect gift for my kids. Are they gonna make decisions that have earthly consequences that are gonna make life challenging sometimes? <laughs> have you met their daddy? <laughs> they get it honest. They, you're gonna mess life up sometimes, but it's okay because God is always there, always wanting to pour back into you, always wanting to bless you. He wants to give us those good and perfect gifts. So there are so many things that God could give us, but focus your attention on the fact that scripture very clearly tells us he wants to give us every good and perfect gift. Focus your imagination on that truth and focus it on the positive side. So in the acronym so far, we have F, focus on the positive. A, affirm yourself. And then I, imagine God doing something good. Tyler, keep it rolling and talk to us about T. I will, but before I do, just just so you know, Wally, that, that I shared this at 9 a.m. too, but... I wanted to, to share it here is that Beth and I just bought a house and, and it was something that we had actually sowed for and were believing for and everything. And it actually had that verse written on the walls in that house. So it, it, it's, it's so crazy you mentioned that. So I, I'm just this validation for what you just said. That's awesome, man, for sure. But our T stands for trust God in all things. Believe that God is always with you. He's present with you even when you don't see him. So no matter where you live, there's going to be some days that you're going to experience some cloudiness, right? So you're going to have these days and possibly even see seasons of overcast or rain or what we would consider bad weather, right? So if you've ever traveled in an airplane, and I know we have some pilots in here today, but if you've ever traveled in an airplane before, as you're going up, you take off and you're going up and up and you're still in the clouds. And then once you pop through and break through the clouds, there it is. The sun hits you as bright as it can be and shining even though there's been clouds there. And it's amazing how something that big and powerful can be hidden by something as simple as clouds and some overcasts. So when you live in a region of some seemingly continuous cloud cover, it's easy to forget that the sun even exists. We feel its heat, but we, see the, but we don't see the light. But even in those times when we've been through a long stretch of overcast days, we must remember that the sun is still there. It's still shining, and it's still doing its job. Whether it's covered by the clouds or it's covered by the darkness of night. We may not see it, but we know it remains. And listen to this. Its power is not dependent upon the condition of the earth. Come on. The sun still shines no matter what is going on on the earth. That's a word right there for somebody because no matter what you do, you don't change the way the Father sees you. You don't change his feelings no matter what the condition is. In the same way, when clouds come to some people's lives, they begin to doubt God's presence and his goodwill towards them. But he's still there, and the sun hasn't stopped shining. Jesus hasn't fallen off his throne, and you may not be able to see him as easily as you used to in the past, but you haven't changed his character. You haven't influenced his ability. You can't do that. You haven't changed his mind about what he believes about you. You can't do that. You don't have that power. He loves you no matter what happens. He sees you the same way. Let's look at Isaiah 26, 3. And it says, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. He trusts you, believer. And we also have this promise right here from Jesus just before he ascended to heaven. He said in Matthew 28, 20, surely I am with you always. When? always to the very end of the age so believer you may not feel like jesus is with you in your distress but i'm here to tell you today that he is he just said it right there in matthew 28 he is with you surely always you can trust him we are called believers for that reason and not feelers that's strong talent 
I want to go back up just a little bit in your notes and just point out a phrase that I'm just going to change some, some letters in the word. I'm not going to change the word, and I'm just going to change some letters. He Let said, me know what you got. Said, Come on. But he's still there. The sun hasn't stopped shining. And your notes is in right. S-U-N. Right. But you go, you go on to say that Jesus hasn't fallen off his throne. When you were reading it or going through it, I read it S-O-N. The sun has not stopped shining. Good, regardless man. of what you're going That's through, so good. regardless of what it looks like, the sun has not stopped shining on you. I'll close with this. I'm going to close with, with H, and it's hope for the best. Hope is what leads us to faith. That's literally what it is. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you don't see. Pastor Gio talked about the, the process of Pastor's Brad House, and I was in the car a lot of times where we would ride out to, at one point was a field, and then there was a, a field full of dirt, and then there was a field with a foundation in it, and then the house started being built, and I can remember like walking through and saying, all right, so this is going to be the kitchen, it's going to be open to the living room, and then my room's here, and this is the laundry room, and this is my big shower, and it's like, all right, cool. Like, I could see it, and I was happy because of what he was hoping for. Like, it was a confident expectation that this thing was going to happen yeah. exactly like I pictured it. Yeah. He had faith in it. And we, we laughed about it while we were going through sermon prep, but we were talking about faith, and I was like, man, Gio made a comment about, can we go eat? And I remember we walked upstairs one time, and <laughs> I was hungry. <laughs> and we walked upstairs, and he was like, all right, cool, so these are going to be the kids' bedrooms? I was like, yep. And, and then I started messing with him. I was like, yep, and the laundry closet's going to be, the, the linen closet's going to be here, and this closet right here is going to be another Laundry room, he was like, no, nah, that's not going to be laundry room. That's going to be storage. I was like, whoa, wait a minute. It changed. It's like, okay. I was hoping that would be a laundry room. But he was confident. Every single day, he was confident in it. Right. And it really changed the way I believe for some stuff. Right. Watching his process, watching how he lived, gives me permission to be as hopeful and as expectant as me and Bree walked through our own processes. I'm going to give you another example. If I said, and I want you guys to picture this in your mind, if I said to no one in particular but to everybody at the same time that I want to bless you tomorrow. So in order to bless you, I'm going to send you guys on a, on a scavenger hunt from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. to find 10 $1,000 checks that I placed all over the city. Glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> right? So Do you say by 6 o'clock? It's going to start 6 at 6 a.m. Okay. All right. oh, so if I told you that, your hope and expectation would uh, instantly go through the roof. Like, man, I hope what Pastor Jamel said is, is what he's going to do. And like, man, when I show up to these addresses that he's going to give us, I expect there to be a $1,000 check there when I, when I get there. Right. You will call off work tomorrow and say, hey, hey, man, I ain't, I ain't going to make it in today. I got to. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> I got to go get tested. But Lord, help us. <laughs> you, would, you would set your alarm and you'll make sure that you're up so that you can get to the first address by, by 6 a.m. because you, the early bird gets the worm. In this case, the early bird gets the $1,000 check because yeah. everybody got the same addresses. And then you would say, hey, well, what about the kids? I, well, got to call a babysitter. You would, line, you would line up your day in the expectation of something good happening. What if we lived every day with that same expectation of God? It's a big deal. Like, we have that permission. If he's given us everything that we need for a life of godliness, he's blessed with every spiritual blessing, and we can live life expectantly and full of hope that tomorrow that God's going to bless us along the way. It's a, it's a big deal. Like, we got to hope for the best because God's plan is to give us the best. Paul wrote this to the church of Philippi. He says, my God will meet all of your needs. And I want to encourage you to define your need with an awareness of God's nature and generosity. Don't sell yourself short. Dream big. Imagine big. Have big faith. Like, if you think you got a big dream, dream bigger because it ain't, it ain't big enough for God. So much more. God introduced himself to his people as Jehovah Jireh. That's the Lord our provider. And then El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. Much later on, Jesus said in John 10, 10, I have come that they may have life and life abundantly. So it's time for you to believe God to meet all of your needs. 
Think of him as wanting to do more than what you can think of, ask for, or imagine. Think of him as wanting to provide a home for you, a place to raise your family, an education, a new vehicle or transportation, and even much more so, gas for that transportation. <laughs> a good job and enough money for you to give like you want to and retire without having to be a burden on your family. See God as someone who will meet all your needs and place your hope in that. His provision may not be on your timetable. It may not come as quickly as you imagine, but that's what hope is all about. Even though it feels like it's not going to show up, surely it will. Habakkuk 2.3, that's one of my favorite verses. Right. Wait for it. It will not tarry. Even though it feels like it tarries, wait for it. It yeah. will not tarry. That's good. Man, I'm reading that thing, and I looked at Chad. It reminded me of an old song I, I grew up with in church. He said, he may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. <laughs> hope is what we do to strengthen and build our faith. And it ultimately leads us to faith. With Jesus' help, you will walk by faith. You can focus on the positive. Affirm yourself. Imagine God doing something good. Trust in God and all things and then hope for the best. And you will win the war in your minds. That's good. I'm going to close by praying over you guys and declaring some new covenant truths over you that you can grasp on to. But I also want to encourage you guys to be here next week for week four as we close out this series these things are practical applications. You can take that acronym and start applying them today and start to see a difference in your life. But next week is going to be absolutely amazing. We have another tremendous voice in the kingdom coming to be with us next week, so you don't want to miss it. I'm not going to tell you who it is, so you got to come see him. So go ahead and stand to your feet. We're going to close with prayer. Pastor Jamel, if you let me add something, that um, I'll be practicing my life. Um, I heard from somebody, you know, when you hear a speaker, um, he was telling... Uh, when you hear the faith, you know what I'm saying? Focus, help me out, affirm, imagine, imagine trust, trust, trust hope. And hope. So I heard this guy, you know, he said we're, um, give it really simple, uh, a way to do it. It was like when you receive the, um, a phone bill, electricity, water bill, whatever, whatever comes the mail, you, the envelopes that we don't want to look at and we don't want to say, oh, God. You know, if he, you're the one, like, when you receive it, like, hey, hallelujah, I got to pay somebody. Uh, you get it. But I not. So this guy was telling, you know, when you receive in the mail, don't open it. Even you know it's, you got to pay, right? That's what we create in mind. When you see the phone bill, like, okay, I got to pay. Last week, last month, it was $300. Live bill was $400. And blah, 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 blah. You know, you know how it is. But why if you come and say, hey, I trust from God. I want to imagine, why if they say, I got some credit from the, from the light bill. And it happened to us, huh? to my family. My wife is here. My wife tried to pay the uh, light bill, and they, they told her, no, actually, you got some credit. Wow. And, I, and I was like, how did that happen? Don't ask a question. Don't ask a question, right. But why if you, when you just put something simple to, uh, in your life, I know we probably... You know what day you got to pay the loud bill? If it's going to be the 14th every month, why if you just receive the, the bill and don't open it? Just be focused to enjoy life. Yeah, why if you say, no, nah, I just going to put it down because I know the 14th, I'm going to open it and I know God's going to provide because we trust God that he's going to do it. We can imagine that it's not going to be what we spent, what we paid last month. It's going to be less or maybe it's going to be some credit. But we got to hope that God can do it in our life. But this is my issue and I've been asking people, do we trust God can do anything, right? Do you agree with me? Yes. Come on. Do you trust God can do anything? Yes. My question to you, do you believe that God can do it in your life? Yes. Come on. Because most of the time we believe when somebody tells a story, they share a testimony, they say, that's my God. He's big. He can do it. But God asks you a question, do you, do you trust that I can do in your life? So that's something that we need to put in practice. We trust God. Do you trust God? God that he can do it in your life yeah, that's so good. man that's good Pastor Gio bow your heads we'll pray in the name of Jesus I declare that you're a believer you believe God's word you are what the word says you are you have what the word says you have and you can do what the word says you can do in Jesus' name, we render ineffective every negative thing we've thought, every thought that's been contrary to the truth of God's word. From this moment forward, we'll acknowledge only the good things that are in us in Christ Jesus. 
out of the good treasure of our heart, only good things will come to pass. We are the righteousness of God, new creations, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Jesus. We've been delivered from the power of darkness and translated to the kingdom of the sons of God's dear son. We've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb, redeemed from the curse of the law, redeemed from sickness, poverty, and death. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We are more than conquerors. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. Since the greater one lives inside of us, we can overcome every situation. The faith of God resides within us, and through it we have the victory that overcomes the world. I thank you, Father, that we can have all these things. We believe it in our hearts, and we have released it with our mouths. So be it. It will surely come to pass in Jesus' name. We will win the war in our minds. Amen. Calvary Wallace, it has been a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you guys for joining me as we finish week three of winning the war in our minds, looking to week four. Before you guys leave, make sure you stop outside. We're going to do the Father's Day drawing. Somebody's going to win some nice prizes out there. So thank you guys. May the good Lord keep you and bless you. May his face shine upon you as you travel throughout your week. We love you and God loves you. Amen.